Hi, this is Pastor Tim Bagwell. I'm so glad that you're watching. I've got such an incredible word to share with you today. I believe it's gonna impact your mind, your spirit, your body, your finances, because there's something about the word. The word will make you free. I know that God cares about you and he cares about your family. He wants to touch your loved ones that are lost. He wants to heal the family member that's sick. He wants to help you be the person that God has called you and ordained you to be. I know that what you're getting ready to hear is going to liberate you, encourage you, and give you strength to face the battles that you're about to face in the future. Well, remember this, we care about you, we're praying for you, for your family, and most of all, remember, you are who God says you are. I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. 1 Corinthians, second chapter, the fourth and fifth verse. If we could just stand momentarily for the reading of the word. Praise God. Praise God. Second, 1 Corinthians, if I said 2 Corinthians, I meant 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, fourth and the fifth verses. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's read it together with the fourth verse. Going back to the fourth verse. Let's read it together. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Father, anoint every ear to hear, every mind to perceive, and every heart to believe in Jesus' name. And everybody said, you may be seated. What I am preaching to you today, and there's other aspects of it, aspects of it that I brought out last week, and I do not have time to even begin to touch into the revelation that God brought forth last week. If you weren't here, then uh, go to the archives and hear the message. But this is becoming the foundation for my next book, and it will be in called Empowering the Next Generation. I was to be honest about it, kind of stuck. And I said, God, I've got so many powerful things that I saw with Moses and Joshua. And then I saw an aspect of Paul and Timothy. And then I saw things with Elijah and Elisha because I believe true empowerment for the future has to come from biblical patterns. It's not just about developing... Uh, life coaching, and I'm not against that, so don't misunderstand. It's not just developing life coaching from more psychological, um, how would I say, strategic plannings. It's really looking at the spiritual side of how do you empower a young man or a young woman to become who they're destined to be. Uh, one of the young men in my church a week or so ago asked me this question, and he said, why do you keep doing what you're doing? And I'm not going to tell you again how old I am, but I will tell you that I started full-time ministry in 1972, and then did you, you ever find out how many days are left in the year? We have 128 days left in this year, and I want you to start believing God for a supernatural doubling in these last 128 days. I started full-time ministry in 1972, and you all can do the math and figure it out, but it's been quite a journey. I don't have anything left to prove, to be honest about it. I don't have any place, you might say, that I have to go. But what I do have to do is understand that a fire has been supernaturally deposited in me. A gift has been supernaturally deposited in me. And because of that gift, across this country and in other nations, people regard me as maybe the preeminent prophetic voice into that church or into that ministry. I have ministries call me on a consistent basis. I'm facing a decision. Pray with me about it. I need wisdom. I need counsel. 
What I begin to understand at this season is my greatest concern about the future is that will there be a generation that will move in the power and the might and the fire of the Holy Ghost? My heroes were men like Oral Roberts and A.A. Allen and Jack Coe, and uh, as well as Amy Semple McPherson. I, I, I read and I studied her life in newspaper clippings of the great revivals here in even Denver, and how this woman built one of the most magnificent sanctuaries in the entire world back in the 1920s and 30s, which I've had the privilege to preach in that great, great facility in Los Angeles. And I think about when I stood in Durban, South Africa, in the Jesus Dome that seated over 7,000, built by the hands of a man that was put in jail so many times because he integrated his services in South Africa. If you know anything about history, you know that was a no-no. And he would not tell the Indian people they could not come in. He would not tell the Zulus that they could not come in. He would demand that his white folk, excuse me, were going to embrace all races and all cultures. And as it began to happen, they would come and they would put Fred Roberts in jail. And I stood in that great sanctuary and it was filled with Indians and filled with Zulus and filled with Afrikaners, as they called them, filled with people that were the children of uh, with integrated relationships. And I saw the tangible manifestation of a man who did not care if he was put in jail for what he believed. And he was in it. And they finally gave up. They finally said, you know, there's not much else we can do with this guy because we're going to turn him loose and he's going to let all these people come in anyway. And they finally started leaving him alone. And they built the great Jesus dome. And I had the privilege of preaching in that place. But what concerns me the most is the fire the baton being passed to the next generation. Paul, even though Paul was the most brilliant theologian of his era, there, nobody could touch Paul. Nobody. The most brilliant student that Gamaliel ever taught. Youngest man to ever become a Pharisee. Grew up in Tarsus with a worldview like few people were ever able to obtain. But yet he was a Jew's Jew and a Roman citizen. And yet... He says these words, I don't come to you with the enticing words of man's wisdom. I come to you in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Recently, we've had uh, some so-called leaders denounce their faith, high profile singers and high profile leaders and people have become devastated by these that are barely dry behind the ears but yet they become famous so if you become famous your voice is important hello so it's devastating to hear these uh, influential leaders denouncing their faith yes it's devastating that your faith does not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The problem we have with leadership today is a majority of them haven't gone through anything. It's kind of been handed to them on a media silver platter. But as we all know, Fires come. It's kind of a graphic analogy, but there was a, a high-profile golden boy in the ministry a few years ago and another man that I knew very well that it, I had looked up to and uh, was a great influence in my life, and we both knew the individual, and it was like no matter what he did, it just all turned to gold. But yet there were things that both of us could see happening in morals and in different things that were compromises. I said, what do you think? And he says, well, we'll see how he does. Excuse me for the graphics. When his guts get kicked out. And then we'll see if he's a man of God 
or just a boy. And it happened. And I thank God, through many dangers, toils, and snares, he was drugged, but it made him into a man. And when he came out on the other side, he was better than when he went in. But he suffered a lot of loss and a lot of humiliation. But the fact of the matter was, there's a moment that your faith cannot stand in the intellectualism or the popularity. Are you with me? Your faith doesn't stand in how many books you've sold. Your faith doesn't stand in how many records you've sold. Your faith doesn't stand in how many people know your name. Your faith doesn't stand in whether you're famous or you're not famous. That isn't where your faith comes from. Your faith comes because you have experienced and you have seen the demonstration and the power of God. If you think you could ever talk Oral Roberts out of the fact was God a miracle working God. He was a man dying with tuberculosis but he experienced the healing. And he was a man that saw over one million people supernaturally healed by the laying on of hands and they were medically documented miracles. He was a man that saw over five million souls come to Jesus at the altars of the great tent revivals that he held. And when he finished the course, he finished the course gloriously. He didn't finish it with scandal. He didn't finish it in defeat. He didn't finish it in fear. He finished finished it as Richard said when he was walking down the hallways of the hospital when Oral was getting ready to breathe his last breath he said I could hear the off key voice of my father singing at the top of his lungs and praising God because his faith did not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God the greatest desire I have right now is that there comes a demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God that is greater than the earth has ever seen, greater than what Oral saw under the tents, greater than what Amy saw. My greatest mentor was Raymond Boatwright, other than my father. And Brother Boatwright went to Angela's Temple. He had just gotten saved in Prescott, Arizona. And he went to Angela's Temple. And people said, you've got to go here, sister. That's what they called her. You've got to go here, sister. And he somehow got in. And he was sitting four or five rows from the front. And a person came down for prayer and their body had growths all over their body, their face, their arms. And he said, sister, touch this woman with all of these cancerous growths that were visible. And he said, I saw God turn every one of those growths to powder. And the woman, one by one, brushed them away off of her face. And I said, I fell on my knees and I said, God, I need this same Holy Ghost that this woman has. And God filled him with the Holy Ghost in the aisles of Angela's temple. And then he goes to Brazil and reaches over 12 million people for Christ in the 1950s. Where did it start? It started with the demonstration of the Spirit. He stood in a five-foot-tall window and preached. They had a little platform, and he, they brought people to him. And for 12, 14 straight hours, he laid his hands on the sick and blind eyes open and deaf ears unstopped. And they carried him away. He hung his perspiration-drenched jacket on a microphone stand. And for six straight hours, people walked by and touched his coat. And cripples were healed and deaf ears were open and blind eyes were open. Where did it all start? He went to Life Bible College. Got his degree. But where did it all start? It started when he saw the demonstration of the Spirit of God, his power. How do we empower ourselves? Because we need it. And how do we pass it to the next generation? Go with me into the book of, I'm going to be in the book of First and Second Timothy. So once you get there, you'll be able to easily. Before I go there, I will be in Romans 1.16, and I just want to read one scripture, and then we'll be in the writings of Paul to Timothy. For I am not ashamed of the gospel 
of Christ. Mm. This is Paul. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am not ashamed. Then go to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Be thou therefore, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Wait, 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 wait. Be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. The first thing we have to get into ourself and get into whatever generation God is going to use us to influence is this simple principle, be not ashamed. No, 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 I got one amen on that. Be not ashamed. Be not ashamed. I remember talking to a young man several years ago, and he was telling me he'd been in some of our crusades years back in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, I, I had some incredible revivals uh, in, in Albuquerque, and he'd been a part of them. And he said, I just wanted to talk to you and, and reconnect. And I said, well, how are things going? He said, well, it's, it's been good for the last nine weeks. Uh, the pastor's been teaching on the gifts of the Holy Ghost. I said, man, that's incredible. I said, I bet you've seen healings and miracles and the prophetic flowing, the word of knowledge. He said, no. He just taught on it. He said, nobody got filled with the Holy Ghost? No. There was no prophetic words? No. Nobody got healed? No. I said, so for nine weeks, you taught on the gifts of the Holy Ghost, but there was no manifestation, there was no demonstration? No manifestation, no demonstration, but we learned about it. And he said, that's what's troubling me. He said, I said in your meetings in every night, there was a manifestation and there was a demonstration and I am who I am today because of what I saw in those crusades that you held at Albuquerque years ago. And he said, Pastor, what is going wrong? What is happening in the body of Christ? We can teach about this, but nobody will let it Manifest. You know what the problem is? We're ashamed of it. We want everything to be intellectually uh, attainable, emotionally palatable. And I've got news for you. When the power of God begins to fall, it can get messy. No, you didn't hear me. I said when the power of God begins to fall, it can get messy. And you want to know something? One of the greatest ways and the quickest ways you can grieve the Spirit is to be embarrassed by the Spirit. And I'm telling you this, it was God that said, dance before the Lord. It was the Holy Ghost that said, clap your hands. It was the Spirit of God that told us to lift our hands. It was the writings of men of God under the influence of the Holy Ghost that said, lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. It was God that came out of the tomb on Resurrection Sunday and the soldiers were slain like dead men. It was the glory of God that fell when the tabernacle was dedicated and the temple was dedicated and the priest couldn't even stand up to minister because of the glory of God and that was in the Old Testament. It was the power of God that fell on Mount Carmel and fire fell out of heaven. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But what has happened? We have become ashamed of it and we get embarrassed by it. If somebody lets out a shout, we're looking around saying I can't bring my friends to that. Maybe what your friends need was what Brother Boatwright needed was to see them brush away some cancerous growth off their body that the demonstration of the spirit and the power would do something in somebody's life that would cause you 20 years later to say my faith does not stand in intellectualism. Both sets of our parents grew up when they called us holy rollers. Because power of God had hit people, they'd be slaying the spirit. They'd dance. Sometimes they would roll. 
You know, sometimes you just don't know what to do. But see, the word ashamed means a feeling of fear or disgrace which prevents a person from doing something. So he said, I am not ashamed. He said, don't you be ashamed of the testimony or of me even though I'm in prison. You can't let a feeling of disgrace or fear come into you that stops you from doing what you're supposed to do and being whom you're supposed to be. Years back, I'm sorry, I'm telling stories. It's 1973, I think, and I was just starting in the ministry, and there was a guy in town that heard me preach. I was preaching for Marilyn and Wally Hickey, and uh, packing the building out two times a day. And the power of God was falling. And this very wealthy businessman, he owned an auto dealership. He said, I, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And he said, he said, what I'd, he said, I've never seen anything like this, period. But then I've never seen anything like this coming out of a, a, a 19 year old man. And I said, well, thank you, sir. You know, I had my Fabio hair back then and <laughs> my uh, double-knit suit and my bell-bottoms that covered my shoes and, you know, on my platforms. And, you know, I was about six foot four when I preached back then. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you, sir. He said, I hear you were talking about having a conference that was all young preachers. Young men of God. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm inviting guys from all over the country that are younger, 30 and under, that are full of the power of God and the Holy Ghost. I want my generation to see that God can use young men. He said, well, I want to do something to help you. He said, I want to put full page ads. I don't know if it was the Rocky Mountain News or the Denver Post. He said, I want to put full page ads advertising this event. I said, well, thank you, man. This is great. And so he started putting full page ads in. And we were down on 11th at a coma and the building was just packed out every night. And the night I preached, because it was all advertised who was preaching when, I had about 50 of my classmates show up. <clears throat> and you know, <clears throat> I went to Lutheran High School. And believe it or not, most of the people that went to Lutheran High School were Lutheran. <laughs> now, thank God for Martin Luther, but, you know, Lutherans are more liturgical in their worship. My Lord, the first chapel service I went to, I was lost as a goose in a snowstorm trying to find out what page of the book they were on. <laughs> well, they all saw this big event in my picture. And we didn't have social media back then, but we had telephones and everybody was calling everybody. So let's go out and hear the Rev preach. And they came out to the meetings. It was like half the balcony seemed like it was full. It seemed like there were thousands of them. And man, I'm, I'm preaching like I always preach. And I'd announced for the whole week, I'm praying for everybody in the building tonight. I'd been announcing it all week, so I couldn't get out of it. And I knew what was going to happen. I knew people were going down. And I started praying for people, and they started stacking up like cordwood. <laughs> I mean, the ushers were stepping on people's heads. and I mean, they couldn't get them off the ground. The whole front of the building was full. Then I had to pray for them on the platform. They're all stacked up. Now, none of my friends came down. They just were watching from the crow's nest. Power of God's falling, the organs wailing, people are dancing, jumping, shouting. It was a full frontal attack, Holy Ghost service. It was high church, baby. And one side of me, I was thrilled to death, and the other side of me says, oh my God. 
So they came down after church and said, hey, we're all going over to our favorite pizza place. Will you come over and join us? I said, they're all being really nice. I didn't know I was being set up. And so I get over to the pizza place after I changed clothes and got over there where we all hung out after basketball games and stuff and the whole pizza joint was full of my graduating class. And one of the guys stood up and he says, we were going to wait and have you pray over the food, but we figured all the tables would flip over. I'm glad you think it was funny because that was the nicest thing that was said all night. I mean, I was, if you ever wanted to be the center of attention, I got it. I was the center of attention. I was laughed at. I was mocked. I was imitated. Well, the guys I knew really well walked up to me when we were breaking up, looked me straight in the eye and said, why do you want to waste your own life doing something so stupid? <sighs> Got in my car. Drove back to the church. Sit down in my little office. Wouldn't even turn the lights on. You ever just get to feeling sorry for yourself and you don't even turn the lights on? I'm sitting in the little office with the lights out feeling sorry for myself. Crying a little bit. (laughs) Embarrassed. And I had an encounter with God that night, 19. God asked me a question, and he spoke the name of the one guy that said some really harsh things to me. He said, I just was wondering if he saved you. He said, you remember when you were a little boy and you had an ear infection and they thought you were going to lose your hearing and your mama came in and laid her hands on you and your ear opened up. I wonder, was he there when I healed you? Oh, you remember on Bob Sunday where the glory of God entered into you and you were filled with the Holy Ghost and you began to speak with other tongues and I changed your life. Uh, Was he there then? Did he do any of that? I said, no, Lord. Who did? I said, you did. Well, then shouldn't you be more concerned about what I think than what they think? See, the first hurdle you've got to get over if you're going to walk in the power of God is you cannot be embarrassed of the power of God. You have to be proud of the power of God. You've got to be able to stand up in the company of family and friends and say, you may think I'm crazy, but let me tell you what God has done in my life. You may think there's something wrong with me, but let me tell you how God made a way where there seemed to be no way. You may think I'm silly because I dance and I shout and I lift up my voice and praise God, but I would have taken my life had it not been for the power of the Holy Ghost. I am not ashamed. You can't make this thing cute. And what we have are weak leaders today because they're unadmittedly embarrassed. God didn't fill them with the Holy Ghost in the upper room and lock the doors. God filled them with the Holy Ghost and the wind drove them right out. And over 3,000 people were saved by the voice of a man who had days before denied the Lord. He was not ashamed. He was not embarrassed. He did not let any sense of disgrace stop him from being who God called him to be. And the first thing you've got to get through to your kids. And the first 
thing you've got to do when you look in the mirror is look at yourself and say, first of all, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Second Timothy 1, 7. I'm not moving in expositorily sequential progression today. You'll just have to bounce all over with me. Second Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. First Timothy 4, 12. These are Paul's words. Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of, belie- of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. The word despise means let no man look down on your youth. Think less of you or put you down. Wow. So first of all, you cannot be ashamed. Secondly, you cannot be afraid. Or intimidated. If we understand this, we have to understand there's always a reason to be despised or to be looked down on. But Paul looks at Timothy, said, Let no man despise thy youth. Now, youth did not mean uh, just somebody 16 or 18 years old. In that culture, it was more or less 40 on down was classified as youth. Now, now again, there there can be scholarly debates over these ages, so, you know, if you want to go do your own research, fine. It's commonly thought that Timothy was converted in Lystra at 16. The next common school of thought was he began to travel with Paul and Silas in his early 20s. Then Paul positioned him in Ephesus, and it's commonly thought that that happened somewhere in his 30s. Now, Paul's speaking to Timothy in both of these epistles, and he's already been positioned as a pastor. And he said, all right, God didn't give you the spirit of fear. His first epistle, uh, I asked the right Reverend Mike Dragon if he had any information on this because I was looking for it and wasn't able to find it. It's probably about, what would you say, three, maybe five year span, if that much. Let's just say about a three year span between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, but both of them are written to Timothy while he's in Ephesus and he's pastoring. So in, in one account, he's being told, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. In the earlier account, in 1 Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. So what's he saying? Timothy, if you go make it, you can't be afraid. And if you're going to make it, you can't be intimidated. And what we have to understand, if we're going to make it, we cannot be ashamed and we cannot be afraid, and we cannot be intimidated. There's always going to be somebody looking down on us. There's always going to be somebody giving you a thumbs down instead of a thumbs up, or a like, a dislike instead of a like. That's always going to happen. Every time I preach, it happens. Everywhere I preach, it happens. Whether it's a uh, whether it's a a little blurt to get your attention to be in church, or whether it's a full message, it's always got somebody's going to despise it. Somebody's going to look down on it. And if you let that affect you, then you will become embarrassed. You will become ashamed. But God said. I didn't give you the spirit of fear. I gave you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. The greatest motion pictures that are made in the greatest books that inspire are all written about people that against all the odds, they were not afraid. Why do men like Braveheart? Because against the odds, Mel Gibson, William Wallace, that's who he was. William Wallace painted his face and drew his sword 
and screamed and hollered at the top of his lungs against the odds. We all cheer at the memory of Jackie Robinson being the first African American to play professional baseball and against the odds and all the taunting and all the verbal abuse and all of the things and the threats. He kept playing ball because he knew he was standing for something bigger and greater than just being a baseball player. Are you following what I'm saying? The Rudy, my God, poor little Rudy who couldn't get on the field for Notre Dame and you'll watch that movie and weep because he wouldn't quit. He wouldn't give up. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't intimidated. What inspires us is people that refuse to stop. What inspires God is a man and a woman that is not bound by the spirit of fear but they walk in power and love and of a sound mind. What moves us that we realize that Paul wasn't intimidated. Peter wasn't intimidated. Thomas wasn't intimidated. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not intimidated. They didn't care. They didn't care who looked down on them. They didn't care who threatened them. They stood up and in essence said, I am who God says I am. If you can be intimidated, you can be stopped. If you can be embarrassed, you can be stopped. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed. So now, if being ashamed can stop us, Paul now adds some influence to Timothy. He says, Study! Work at it, man! Now, let's get this in perspective. This is not the 16-year-old that has just been converted at Lystra. This is not the 20-year-old that just went on the road with, with Paul and Silas. No, this is the man who is the bishop of the Ephesian church, who for your information was the largest church in the world. They estimate somewhere around conservatively 40,000 people were in the Ephesian church. And Paul said, how dare him? Tell the great Timotheus, study to show thyself approved. A workman that needs not be ashamed, that needs not to be prevented from doing what you're called to do because of fear or disgrace. Because when you study, fear moves. When you study, embarrassment moves. When you study, you realize how great your God is. So the more you study, the more you are empowered. But yet even the most brilliant man said, I've studied, but I still come to you in the demonstration of the spirit. Because the more you study, the more you realize that demonstration and manifestation is God's way. So he says, study. Okay. You cannot be ashamed, so you can't be ashamed. But if you're ashamed, your kids will be ashamed. If you're afraid and intimidated, you will pass the spirit of fear and intimidation to your children. And if you don't open your Bible and study the Word of God, your children will never open their Bible and study the Word. Those you have influence will not dig in, and then they will become ashamed because they have not received the revelation of the Word. I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. No. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. My son, be thou strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, all right, don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Study to make sure you're not ashamed. Now, put the scripture back up, please. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The word grace there transliterates to the word favor. Now, I'm strong because I know that I have favor with God. I've been reading Jerry Savelle's book on favor. And one of the things that stuck out, uh, there's so many great points that he brings out, but one of the things that uh, really grabbed me this week as I was rereading it again was the fact of you have to declare favor. 
He said, everything that happens in the word, as I have preached to you many times, God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke it. Favor becomes manifested through declaration. So now he's telling Timothy, the favor, be strong in essence because of your revelation of the favor. And when you're feeling like this, you know, and you're just kind of bent over with the load, do any of you ever just get weighted down? The three of you. I said, is anybody going to be honest and say, I get weighted down? Do, have any of you ever felt like giving up? Have any of you ever been discouraged? Oh, my, two hands are going up now. All right, well, to be discouraged means to be weakened. But he says, be strong in the favor or the grace now, I'm not talking about this favor grace thing that everybody gets into with, well, I'm not getting into that. Uh, but it, grace is God's ability to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. That's a proper scriptural definition. Grace is also unmerited favor. You don't deserve the favor, but you have the favor. So you're all bent down and you're discouraged, but all of a sudden a revelation starts hitting you. Wait a minute. I am a son, I am a daughter of God. I am the light of the world. I'm the salt of the earth. I'm a king. I'm a priest unto God and unto his father. I'm part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people that show forth the praises of God that brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you following me? All of a sudden, you're being strengthened. You're being strengthened by your revelation of the grace slash favor of God. And when you begin to understand the favor of God is upon you, and you say, well, I don't deserve Of course you don't deserve it because grace is unmerited. It's not something you have earned. It's a gift that has been given to you. So for you to walk in it, all you simply have to do is believe it. You have to declare it. I have the favor of God. I have the favor of God. I have the favor of God. I'm one of God's favorites. Oh, I can't say that, Pastor. Well, then you're going to be weak. But when you can stand up and say, I am one of God's favorites, look in the mirror and say, I am one of God's favorites. Uh, oh, my Lord, everybody else thinks they're one of God's favorites, but I know I'm one of God's favorites. Uh, I'm one of the best-looking men in the kingdom of God. God and I'm one of God's favorites. Oh, my light shines. Oh, I'm so salty. I can preserve the world. Whoo! I got chosen before I was ever brought forth out of my mother's womb. I'm royal. Step aside, Harry. Step aside, Prince Charles. I'm part of a royal generation. In the millennial, I'm going to take over England. Oh, some of you don't get what I'm say it but be strong in grace be strong because you know you're favored of God where are we first Timothy 6 12 all right now, don't be ashamed don't be afraid don't be intimidated study so you're not ashamed and be strong because of favor. Now, 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Hmm. 1 Timothy 1, 18. 1 Timothy 1, 18. This charge or command I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by, by them mightest war a good warfare. So now you got to be a fighter. No, no, you didn't hear me. You got to be a fighter. If there's no fight in you, you're not going to make any impact in the kingdom. If we're going to be kingdom men rising, we're going to have to be fighters. If you're going to be kingdom women rising, you're going to have to be fighters. You're going to have to be an Izer. You're going to have to be a princess warrior. My wife preached a masterpiece on that. She needs to preach it again. And she's preaching about being a princess warrior. And we, we got all this princess stuff floating around that Disney's portrayed. But I'm telling you, a woman of God has a helmet on her head and a sword in her hand. She's a fighter. She'll shut that prayer closet door and she won't come out till she knows God has made a way where there seems to be no way. Women 
women pray for their kids like nobody else will. Grandmas pray for their grandchildren. Mothers pray for their sons and their daughters, their isers, their warriors, their fighters. Men, if we're going to be kingdom men rising, then we're going to have to be fighters. We're going to have to be warriors. We can't let a little criticism stop us. We can't be made fun of stop us. We can't let betrayal stop us. He said that through the prophecies, you will war a good warfare. He says, fight the good fight. Some of us are fighting the wrong fight. No, you didn't hear that. Some of us are fighting the wrong fight. You can't fight the good fight because you're so busy fighting the wrong fight. You're at odds with your family. You're at odds with your husband. You're at odds with your wife. You're at odds with your kids. Are you following me? You're mad at somebody on CNN or you're angry at somebody on Fox News or you're mad at Rush Limbaugh or you're mad at some liberal. What am I saying? You're fighting the wrong fight. He said fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. No, you're not hearing me. Fight the good fight of faith. I better say it again. Fight the good fight of faith. Some of you are just picking the wrong battles. You're picking the wrong wars. But he said, according to the prophecies, when you hear your prophecies, you know what fights you need to be fighting. When you hear the thus saith the Lord over your life, you pick up the sword and say, wait just a minute. I know what fight I'm supposed to be fighting fighting. I'm not called to fight over here. This is where I'm called to fight. I'm not called to argue over this. This is where I fight. If I am who God says I am, I have to fight the good fight. And the prophecies, my voice broke. Woo! reaching puberty I guess <laughs> fight fight according to the prophecies that keeps you in your lane but some of you are all over the world doing all sorts of things when you're fighting the good fight you stay right where you're supposed to be because you know what God said about you. So according to the prophecies that you may war a good warfare. So now, God, here's what I'm called to do. This is who I'm called to be. This is what I'm called to be doing. So now when you have to fight, are you fighting for what God called you to fight for? Whew. Look over to him and say, that's good stuff. That's a good spot to shout right there. Thank you. See, so we have to be fighters, but we have to be fighting the right fights. Now, I don't want to pick a fight with Chris. Come on, show him, Chris. Come on, buddy. Show, come on, give him a little arm there. Show him the other arm. That, that one's bigger. Yeah, see, that one's even bigger. If you think I'm going to pick a fight with him, that's picking the wrong fight. You got to know what fight to pick. And that doesn't mean your adversary is weak because Goliath wasn't weak, but it was the right fight. Hmm. 2 Timothy 1 5 and 6. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee to remember, so I stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, now wait a minute here. Here we have Mr. Success. Paul's in jail, and he's writing to Mr. Success. Paul's abandoned, and he's writing to Mr. Success. Oh, Timothy on the cover of Charisma, biggest church in the world. Paul's in jail. They're writing a little editorial about Paul. Why is Paul in jail? There must have been something sinful that occurred in his life for these negatives to occur in his life. But Timothy, oh, Timothy's done everything right. He's preaching to the biggest church in the world. Paul writes to him and says, all right, stir up your gift. 
See, Paul realized for Timothy to continue to carry what Paul had carried, Paul knew he had to keep his gifts stirred, fan his flame to do it. Then the next scripture talks about, he tells Timothy, don't neglect the gift. So when you go into 1 Timothy 4.14, now understand the context, both, of the, both context, he's pastoring, he's leading. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy in the laying on of hands of the presbytery. It was a supernatural demonstration and a supernatural impartation, and don't neglect it. See, we have a whole generation of young ministry today that are neglecting the gifts that in many ways propelled them into ministry. Because something got them a little bit ashamed or afraid or intimidated or maybe motivated thinking that if I don't do this, I'll have more people in the pews. Well, they're doing it right and you sure aren't. No, I'm doing it right. I'm doing it right. Because I'm doing it the way Paul told Timothy to do it. And I don't care how smart everybody thinks they are. Paul was smarter. And so he said, now, stir up your gift. Stir up your gift. Now, if you don't keep your gift stirred... You can't get the next generation to stir their gifts because they don't even understand what the gift is. If you're not stirring your gifts, how is your daughter going to stir her gifts? How will your grandchildren understand how to stir their gifts? Because they never saw you stir your gifts. If you don't prayerfully attend, do you realize every week that I preach, I pray God stir the gift that is in me. I can put a sermon together, baby. I don't even need to put one together. I have got legal pads as tall as I am. I have got, I preached over 15,000 times. I've got notes. Nobody understands them but me. But I got notes, baby. They are nearly six feet tall in legal pads that have multiple pages. I don't need to just put a sermon together. But I need my gift stirred. See, because I'd rather see you get a breakthrough than walk out of here saying that was a good sermon. But this is a good sermon. But the thing is... If I can touch you and burdens can get removed and yokes can get destroyed, hear me. Then you're going to walk out of here with something that your faith will not stand in just the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And for those of you that are getting nervous because of the clock, I'm almost done. But I'm telling you, Paul told him, don't neglect your gift. Don't neglect your gift. Don't neglect your gift. You're under pressure, Timothy. Why do you think he told him to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake? He was uptight. Oh, Pastor Bagwell, I know that had to be grape juice. Grape juice doesn't do anything for your stomach. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But the whole bottom line was he knew how tensed up Timothy was. He knew how stressed he was. He knew the pressure he was under. He gave him a little practical advice. But he also knew if you're really going to calm down, if you're really going to have peace, if you're really going to have joy, if you're really going to be able to function and endure this thing like I have endured it, then you better wake up. The source of that is moving in the power of the Holy Ghost and using your gifts. Don't neglect your gifts. If you neglect neglect anything, it will begin to decay. If you neglect your house, it will begin to run down. If you neglect your car, it will break down. If you neglect your marriage, it will end up in ruination. If you neglect your health, you will be in the hospital. And if you neglect your gift, you are neglecting your source of power that will bring you from one place to the next. I'm here to tell you today, hear this man in jail said to the 
the most successful preacher in the world. Don't neglect your gift. Stir up your gift. And if you do it, you're going to make it, baby. And I'm here to tell you, if you'll stir your gifts up, if you'll get your kids on fire for God, if you'll get them to stir their gifts up, you're going to make it, they're going to make it, and you're going to see the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, give you greater blessings. uh, And someday there's coming a Joseph uh, that's going to take back everything the enemy's stolen. Oh, yeah. Last scripture, 1 Timothy 6, 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Talks about the love of money being the root of all evil. Talks about a lot of different things. Key word, flee. Sometimes you just have to run from some stuff. O man of God, flee these things. And follow after righteousness, God in his faith, love, patience, and meekness. And I, I just want to say something to you. We are in a cultural dynamic of we are trying to change the Bible to fit our lifestyle. And God didn't call us to change the Bible. He called us to change our lifestyle. Now, I'm going to say that again, and you better shout, or I'm going to come after you. God didn't call us to change the Bible. He called us to change our lifestyle. He said, flee these things. He said, the love of money is the root of all evil. So what's he saying? Flee from the love of money, but you're fleeing from that which is the root of of all evil. So what's he saying? Flee all evil. And there's a way to do that. That money doesn't become your God. I'm, I'm on the home stretch. Believe me. Secretariat coming around the bend. Now, flee. Now we got in this greasy grace philosophy. And basically, it's just a flowered up once saved always saved doctrine everything past present and future is all taken care of fine go with it whatever you want to do with it i look at it this way i have a choice to make i can either live in a cycle of just pretty much saying no matter what i do no matter how i do it it's all okay or i can flee it you don't dance with the devil and not get burnt But we're teaching our kids this. Because we don't want anybody to feel bad. There are winners and losers. But now everybody gets badges. Everybody gets medals. My Lord. I remember walking with my head down. She got my rump kicked. My dad had slapped me on the back and said... There's always the next game, son. You gave it everything you had. Yeah, but they whooped us, Dad. Doesn't matter. There's another battle, another day. It wasn't like, hey, you know, that's really cool you went out and had sex with that girl. High five, son. Don't worry about eternity. quiet. Don't worry about that. It's all taken care of. No, I I was taught to flee adultery. I was taught to flee fornication. But we don't want anybody to feel bad. If you are shacking up, baby, it's not right. If you're having sex outside of marriage, I didn't write the book. He did. I'm in trouble now. No, I didn't write the book. You know what God calls it? Fornication. And if you're cheating on your wife, even though she didn't bake you your favorite biscuit, and she hurt your feelings, and you're having an affair, that's adultery. 
And you know what? God categorizes that as sin. Oh, and what happens with sin? The wages of sin is death. Oh, well, God didn't really mean that. He was just having a bad hair day. <laughs> no, stay with me. So Paul is telling Timothy, flee these things. There are certain things you just get as far away from it as you can get. Now, some people could walk into a bar and begin to witness to everybody in that bar and begin to tell them how great God is and have an altar call uh, right, at, uh, right at cheers and just say, here, we're going to have a move of God right here. Other people, if they even get near the door of a bar, they're going to really be battling uh, with knocking down seven and sevens and drinking beer and getting drunk and getting back into a lifestyle of bondage. There are certain things you've got to understand. You've got to stay away from them. You got to flee them. You got to run from them. You've got to realize God has a better plan for you than that. If evil and sin is what it is and the devil is your adversary, unless you're going nose to nose with him to decapitate him, you don't want to play his game. You don't want to be at his party. You don't want to be at his presence. Say, I don't like to be condemned. I'm not just, I'm not condemning you. I'm trying to empower you to be a world changer and world changers flee what is evil. So when you say things like that, I feel bad. Then stop what you're doing. I didn't write all liars to find their part in the lake of fire. Get mad at God, not me. If you're lying and you feel bad because I brought it up, stop it. This is deep. If you're committed adultery, stop it. If you're committed fornication, stop it. If you're abusing your loved ones, stop it. Flee, stop it. Flee, stop it. Flee, stop it. And teach your children to flee and stop it. Don't do that. But they're all grown up. Don't do that. But they got that. Don't do that. Have you saw one of your kids get out of line? I'm sure. Oh, amen. Yeah, I about had a Holy Ghost fit on that one. Would you just actually just say, don't do that. That's what, maybe not, you might say it a little more graphically than that, but, uh, but, but even though they're all grown up, sometimes you just got to say, stop it. Don't do that. Stop it. You do that with the little ones. Don't do that. Now, she does it, but she says, Tristan, you tell them not to do that. I know how you mothers are. And the last key point, and I know I've, I've held you... This is good. But somewhere along the line, if we empower the next generation, we first have to empower ourselves. You got to look at yourself and say, stop that. That's not just your wife's job. But my, my, my wife has the voice of God many times. Stop that. Don't do that. No, sometimes you got to look in the mirror and say, stop it. You'll hear something come out of your mouth and you have to say, stop that. You'll start going down the wrong path. Stop it. Instead of saying, how close can I get to sin? You can hear and say, I'm moving on up. How far can I get away from it? Oh, and if I'm going to get close to you, devil, you're going to rue the day because I'm going to take you out because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We've seen pictures of funny things in sports and one of the funniest is some guy got the ball and he got turned around and he ran the complete wrong direction and scored a touchdown for the other team. And I felt really bad for him because 
I don't know who he was, thank God, but because I would call his name out if I knew. Uh, but you know, some of us are running the wrong direction, and we keep scoring for the other team. Some of us are shooting baskets in the wrong goal. Some of us are moving the complete opposite direction of what God's called us to move. And not only are we scoring for the other team, but we're showing our children how to score for the other team. At least let them look at you and say, my mom and dad, my grandparents were never ashamed. They were never afraid and they were never intimidated. They studied and because of their studies, they were not ashamed. And they were strong in grace and their strength was in the knowledge of the favor of God. They stirred their gifts. They did not neglect their gifts. And they stayed as far away as they could from sin. Gala's mom's generation went to some extremes as my parents' generation did in what they called holiness. And I'm, you're getting all this for free. But when they would walk the sidewalks of their city, if they approached a bar, they would cross the street and go to the other side of the street. They wouldn't change directions, they just distanced themselves. The old holiness days, going to a movie was absolutely, that was almost right there with blasphemy. And if they'd get near a movie theater, they would cross the street, wouldn't change directions. They just cross the street and created distance between them and that theater. Well, that's a little extreme. Just listen to my point. They were something so instilled in them. You stay as far away from sin as you can literally and spiritually. That's why they dress different. That's why they wore their hair different. Am I advocating all that? No, I'm just trying to bring up a principle. There was something that was being instilled in them that I don't say was necessarily as it should have been. But there was something being said in it. You're different. Now we're on a mission to be like the world. Let's make church as worldly as we can. Let's make it like, as much like the club as we can. Or let's see what they're playing on secular radio and then let's copy it. Because we want everybody to be comfortable. I say, many are the afflictions of the righteous. God will deliver us out of them all. I'm, I'm saying to you today, if we will be empowered to empower, Paul laid it out pretty good to Timothy. Not talking to some little boy, but talking to the most highly successful pastor in the world. And saying, son, don't neglect your gift. Don't ever be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Study, man. Keep working it. And flee all evil. Amen.